Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldone book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is The Scottish Prisoner, episode 72, week four. Well, hello! I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with you this week. It has been the week of the plague for me. Just a virus, and all the while I kept thinking, what would Claire do? What would Claire do? There will be an Outlander Science Club podcast on that. I had much time prone to be thinking of such things. So that's why my voice sounds congested, because... I'm at the tail end of this thing, and I didn't want to wait any longer to get this episode out to you. So, hello, hello, hello. Anything from Outlander World? Well, Matt Roberts, writer-producer for Outlander series, started showing pictures from South Africa. Katrina and Sam are not there yet, so it looks like it might be production writers we're down there now because Sam and Katrina will be at the Emerald City Comic Con. I believe that's what it's called next weekend. So they can't be in South Africa until after they do that. So as we get started here, I wanted to let you know to keep my voice in tip top shape for the art of it all. I'm drinking a hot toddy with three heavy drams of Glenfiddich in it. That's about the size of my head. This cup holds about half a pot of coffee. (laughs) Seriously, it's for the art. Whiskey, art, go hand in hand. Okay, let's jump in. So, chapter seven. When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. What a chapter title. Sometimes I don't look at them And think, what does that mean? This one is unusual to me. Let's see if we can figure out what it means. We left off with Jamie getting unceremoniously and without information taken from Hellwater by an officer and two soldiers. And it's quite a ride to London from the north end of England. And remember, Jamie wasn't allowed time to clean up, pack any belongings, do anything. He was brought into the house and then quickly escorted out again. His feet are still covered in all the things of the barn, including manure. They just took him, and on the road they went. You know he's got to be worried. He's got to be thinking, prison? Why has my parole been revoked? He's going to be doing all these wild things in his head, right? And the other part of this is, Outside of going to the little tiny town near Hellwater and that wild ride the night that William was born, Jamie hasn't been allowed anywhere, and he's never been allowed anywhere alone. He's basically been on the estate for four years. So think of that as we move into the change of scenery, because Jamie hasn't had anything to read that we know of. He hasn't been interacting with very many people. He's been under an assumed name, so he hasn't even had his own identity. This has been years. And also, as we go through this book, I want you to think about how this ties into Voyager, and if you've read any of the future books, how it ties into who he is and what made him the man he became once we get into Voyager and later. While traveling, they would stop to eat, and he was fed decently. They gave him a cloak for the ride, and they mostly ignored him and only gave him occasional glances to say, don't you try anything. (laughs) And he thinks he could have escaped from Hellwater much more easily if he had desired to than this road trip. They gossiped and told low jokes, as Jamie put it, And even though he knew they were going to London, he had no notion of the destination within London they were going to. He had no notion of the destination within London they were going to. At the second stop, there was decent wine. He drank carefully as he had nothing stronger than small beer for years. 
Small beer or small ale is watered down ale. It's a low proof. It's something that children would drink. Think of it as heavy duty water with calories in it because water wasn't always safe to drink, right? They didn't know they had to boil it or test it for cleanliness, the things that we do now. And that night they shared three bottles of wine and it was delicious, he said. Not thinking because he had no idea where he was going was exactly what he needed at that moment. It didn't help though, as he couldn't keep his mind off the mysterious destination. And here's what else creeps up in his mind. Rhinoceros, Claire said with a muffled snort of amusement that stirred the hairs on his chest. Have you ever seen one? I have, he said, shifting her weight so she rested more comfortably in the hollow of his shoulder. In Louisa Zoo, I... That would stick in the mind. And abruptly, she vanished and left him sitting there blinking stupidly into his wine cup. <laughs> what do you make of it, though, that Claire comes to mind so much that she keeps appearing to him? Now, remember, this is 14 years later. That's a long time. And he wonders if the memory has been real or was it his desire that brought her to life because he's left both comforted and causing him longing. Like, does he just need her there regardless of how it makes him feel afterward? And he wonders about that too. But he keeps her extremely close. And the soldiers were staring at him and he was smiling. He looked back at them over his cup, keeping the expression... Imagine how wildly improper he must look in that English tavern. And now he's grinning like a loon at them. They looked away most uncomfortable with it. And he went back to his wife happily. <laughs> and to London they went. Jamie tries to be unimpressed by seeing London. He doesn't want to give these soldiers the satisfaction of seeing him wowed again. He hasn't seen a city in 14 years. He went from Culloden to Lollybrock and the cave to prison to Hellwater. So he has not seen a big city in 14 years. Imagine the progress from the time he'd been in Edinburgh. That's amazing. And even though he was really well-traveled and had been to Paris... It had been 15 years since he'd been in Paris. So much must be different. Here's how he describes it. So this was London. It had the stink of any city, the narrow alleys, the smell of slops and chimney smoke. But any large city had its own soul, and London was quite different from either Paris or Edinburgh. Paris was secretive, self-satisfied. Edinburgh solidly busy, a merchant's town. But this, it was rowdy, churning like an anthill and gave off a sense of pushing as though the energy of the place would burst its bonds and spill out over the countryside, spill out into the world at large. His blood stirred despite his fears and the tooth jolting ride. And because of the situation, Jamie's going to have memories of Culloden. Those are his last real individual memories that he had. Everything from there was him hiding and being imprisoned in some sense for the last 14 years. He hasn't had, quote, his own experiences really. Well, except, you know, the Seal Island thing and the deranged man that the governor of Ardsmere took him to. But he doesn't have a lot of his own world memories anymore. I mean, nothing new has been created, is what I'm trying to say. And now he's thinking about the Jacobite soldiers talking about London, the wild tales. But none had ever seen a city before going to Edinburgh. So it was all that they had heard. And then he has a really funny memory of Murdo Lindsay saying, whole families could stay dead drunk, and that was the poor ones. <laughs> because it was a rich city. Gold plates, and everything was gilded, and... That's what the imagery was coming off of it. 
But the Jacobite campaign had turned, and winter came. Still there was talk and whispers, not of gold plates and holland gin, but of the gallows, and the bridge where the heads of traitors were displayed, of the tower. Jamie worried maybe they were taking him there. He was a convicted traitor, regardless of being paroled for four years. His own grandsire, Lord Lovett, had met his own end on that hill. At this he prayed peace on his grandfather's soul. He tried to imagine what the Tower of London looked like. He thought he should be prepared for prison. If you haven't looked into the history of the Tower of London, which I'm sure many of you have, it has been a symbol of abject terror for centuries. Centuries. I don't know anything else that has had that sort of hold or was in use for that long. Maybe the guillotine, but I don't think that had anything on the Tower of London. It shriveled his heart to think of it and of William. He might never see the boy again. He was sure he wouldn't. The only bright spot is they might readily kill him. Of course, to logical Jamie, it made no sense why his parole would have been revoked, even with that last disastrous conversation from 18 months before. He clenched his fists until one of the soldiers eyed him. Instead, he grabbed his thighs hard enough to leave bruises. Can't you wait to hear all about that conversation? I know we saw part of it in Voyager, but did we see everything? Mm, can't wait. Could John have been holding a grudge this whole time? They had both said terrible things and meant them. He thought hot-blooded speaking was no excuse. Then he sees it. He gasps as they pass the tower. The soldiers stop their conversation at this. And, of course, the soldiers were enjoying his shock, and they all grinned at him, and he refused to let them see him cower, and Jamie refuses to let them see him cower. He only had his pride, and that was big enough. But they didn't stop. They drove right on past, and he finally breathed after realizing he'd been holding his breath. Jamie was fearful. And he broke out into a sweat, and fear reeked upon him. One of the soldiers was wrinkling his nose, and Jamie gives him a look. And this is what the look said. Could have been worse, Savalik. Till it... One of the soldiers was wrinkling his nose at Jamie's smell. And he looked at him dead on, thinking, Could have been worse, Avalik. I might have shipped myself and you'd have to ride into London smelling that. <laughs> oh, Jamie is back. Humor is his go-to place. Claire gets clinical, and she surveys the landscape and makes make sure of all the moving parts and pieces and where she fits. And Jamie is humorous. Never fails. And due to traffic, much like today, I suspect, it took another hour before they arrived at a large house that astonished him. Who lived here? And why did they want him? He, of course, refuses to ask the soldiers since they didn't tell him on their own. Pride, indeed. When the lieutenant knocks on the door and says to the butler, his grace said to bring him, and here he is, Jamie wonders if it's the Duke of Cumberland. He'd seen him once leaving Culloden when he was hidden under hay being sent back to Lollybrock. The Duke had been waving his finger in the smoke of the Jacobite dead. All these things that Jamie doesn't like to think about come reeling back. And he's so lost in thought 
that the soldiers jerk and look at him. And instead of being fearful anymore, he now has rage inside. Because if this was Cumberland's residence, he would try and kill him the first chance he got. The idea lit his soul and gave him purpose. Don't you think it's interesting that he's making all these assumptions? It sort of reminds me of something that Claire would do. Where she gets ahead of herself. And instead of waiting, she jumps in, assuming she knows the answer. And sometimes she's wrong. And to me, it looks like Jamie's doing the same thing. He's building on only what he knows, but his information is old. And he's refusing to ask questions. Interesting. As he makes his way in the house, the butler sneers at him. And a woman opens the door in the hallway and she gasps and closes it again. And Jamie thinks he would have liked to have wiped his sandals. He didn't want to foul the house. But as the soldiers escorted him, he left dust and mud and caked manure along the polished floor. I believe this is a way of dehumanizing him again, making him a savage, making him a brute, making him less than. And I don't know if Diana meant to have this be a symbolism of how the Scottish were viewed after Culloden. It became very well mainstream thought of the English that the Scots were barbaric savages. Well, especially the Highlanders, of course. And that played out into their roles in military future where the Scots would be the first in they were the expendables so I wonder if that's part of this imagery here and the symbology but I'm not sure I'm just throwing it out there tell me what you think but he's not allowed to clean up and to be presentable and to have the status that he actually carries Jamie is hyper alert as they enter the room He's looking around for anything to use as a weapon. And then he meets the eye of the man at the desk. It wasn't Cumberland. Even all these years couldn't have changed him into the man sitting behind that desk, looking up at him and frowning. The man says, Mr. Fraser. And Jamie wants to know who he is. And the man clearly is not happy with the lieutenant for not telling Jamie who he was. And he dismisses the lieutenant. But Jamie has the soldier's name now. And he files it away. And he looks at the man and thinks he knows him from somewhere. And the man inquires to Jamie's treatment on the journey. And he asks this familiar face why he's here. When the man drew a deep breath, his face relaxed, and Jamie knew who it was from the fine-boned and beautiful shape of it. Interesting, his description. Jesus, your John Gray's brother, Lord Melton, Jesus Christ! <laughs> and then Pardlow's dry response. Well, yes, though I don't use that title any longer. I've become the Duke of Pardlow since we last met. It has been some time. Please sit down, Mr. Fraser. I'm sorry I can no longer do an English accent next to a Scottish accent. <laughs> I will have to practice. Now the fun has begun. And Jamie must be absolutely gobsmacked at this. So this is the end of the chapter. And what about that chapter title? When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. Well, I looked it up because I couldn't figure it out from the text. And it's from Samuel Johnson. Why, sir, you find no man at all intellectual who is willing to leave London. No, sir. When a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For there is in London all that life can afford. So looking at that quote, now that explains 
the title of the chapter because Jamie was talking about how the Jacobites, when they were looking at conquering London and their fantasies about it, everything was there. Gold plates, gilded carriages, as far as the eye could see. It was the land of plenty and fortune, and even the very poor could stay dead drunk all the time. And here's the context of it. Boswell and Johnson were discussing whether or not Boswell's affection for London would wear thin should he choose to live there as opposed to the zest he felt in his occasional visits. Boswell lived in Scotland and visited only periodically. Some people are surprised to learn that Boswell and Johnson were far from inseparable over the last 20 years of Johnson's life. That's the period that Boswell knew him. This discussion happened on September 20th, 1777. And Johnson, someone who hated to spend time alone, was always going out and enjoying what London had to offer. So the quote applies well to what Jamie was saying, but it's 17 years after the time period in the chapter. So there you go. Chapter 8, Debts of Honor. Jamie just stands there, astonished. Then he suddenly sits, but the chair beneath him feels a bit flimsy, and he's leaving dust and dirt everywhere. Pardlow yells for his footman, Pilcock. I'm sort of glad my name isn't Pilcock. I haven't looked up its meaning, but in modern day. Jamie hears the deferential tread of the man. He seems to be on high alert for such behavior and refuses to act thusly. His pride, his true self and standing is upon him no matter what the circumstance. No matter if he's clean or dirty, if he's properly dressed or not. Pardlow tells his footman to bring whiskey and various foods as he's eyeing Jamie. The footman makes a noise of question, and Pardlow is irritated. And he says, How should I know? Meat pies, leftover joint, roast peacock, for God's sake. Go ask cook. Go ask mistress. <laughs> He's just used to getting what he wants. He doesn't want to deal with the details. That handled, Pardlow shakes his head. So, this is Hal, or Harold. Duke of Pardlow, used to be Lord Melton, Lord John Gray's older brother. He has a lot of names. He asks if Jamie recalls him now. A simple, I do, is said. And the memories jar him as much as finding this man instead of Cumberland. He has to steady himself. Again, Jamie has been removed for four years from everything in any normal life, Prior to that, he'd been in prison. Before that, he'd hidden in a cave. And before that, well, that's where he met Pardlow, who was Melton. He had 14 years of lacking any normal life. And before that, it was the campaign. So his, nearly his whole adult life has been chaos. Picture how everything would be really unsettling to him. And his last free memories are of Culloden. He recalls the scene. Two days past the battle and the smoke of burning bodies swirled thick over the moor, a greasy fog that seeped into the cottage where the wounded Jacobite officers had taken refuge. They crossed the carnage of the field together, bleeding, frozen, stumbling, helping one another, dragging one another to a temporary and totally illusory safety. How much had Jamie been trying to push these down? And let's recall the beginning of Voyager, when Jamie woke up dead, remember? That shocking jolt. This is more detail on that feeling. Waking to... A dead Blackjack Randall crushing his wounded leg. And him crushing that leg is keeping Jamie from bleeding out. The irony. 
The idea that Black Jack Randall saved his life is one last indignity to Jamie. He saved Jamie from dying as he had planned. Even in his death, Black Jack Randall foiled Jamie. He didn't release him. Jamie's friends had found him, got him to his feet, and took him to the cottage. His wound was severe, and he figured he'd be dead from the infection quickly. Well, two days had passed when Melton, now Pardlow, came. He began taking out the hold-up men one by one and shooting them. And Jamie, though asking to be shot, was sent home to Lollybrock. That was that personal debt, because he did not kill John Gray that night in the camp, way back when he was 16 and Jamie broke his arm. After all this running through his head, with a look of unfriendliness, Jamie says, I mind you. I'm thinking about the size differential between these two men. And Lord John Gray is about the height of Claire, not much taller. In the book, she's 5'6", 120-some pounds. She's English curvy, where she's smaller on top with the booty. And Lord John Gray is not much bigger than her. And Hal is probably about the same size. And think about how towering Jamie is in this room, in this space. <laughs> and put that image in your head. Does he really not care what Pardlow thinks of him? Does he have no emotional reserves to be polite? Does it matter? He's there. He has to be there and he can't do anything about it. At this, Pardlow motions Jamie to a chair near the hearth. As Jamie settles in, he notices how sturdy this chair is. It bears his weight without creaking. So his size has come into play again. So we're seeing some repeated themes, though they're very subtle in this chapter. Pardlow yells for Pilcock, but it wasn't he or the butler who appeared. It was the woman who Jamie glimpsed on the way in. He thought his heart might stop. She says Pilcock's busy, and what do you want? That makes me laugh. And Jamie thinks she's older but still pretty. He knows her. It's so intriguing. No obvious married speak happens, and Pardlow just says, Busy? Doing what? She explains she sent him to the attics to get a portmanteau, which is a large trunk or suitcase, typically made of stiff leather and opening into two equal parts. For poor John, since Pardlow is sending him to Ireland, it's the least they can do. She gave Jamie a brief glance before looking back at the Duke. And Jamie sees one neat eyebrow arch in question. Like, is she saying, what is he doing here? What the hell? I wonder exactly what that eyebrow question was. And here's Jamie's thoughts while this is going on. This is Jamie's thoughts while this is going on. Jesus, they're married then. He could see that instant communication and gesture and the Duke's grimace of acknowledgement. She's his wife. The green printed wallpaper behind the Duke suddenly began to flicker and the sides of his jaws went cold. With a remote sense of shock, he realized that he was about to faint. This was all too much for Jamie to be taking in. He thought he was going to prison and got all worked up and adrenaline-filled and fearful by the tower. Then he thought it was Cumberland's house. And then he went from fearful to raging and had no place to put that rage. And then he realizes... It's Lord Melton, now known as the Duke of Pardlow, John's brother, and this woman comes in that he also knows. That's a lot to hit his system after being at Hellwater for four years. Poor Jamie. Well, they realize Jamie's about to faint and move into action. And Jamie saw her alarmed and warning face. They steadied him, putting his head between his knees, she goes to hand Pardlow brandy, but he asks for a snuff box instead. There's smelling salts there. If you've never experienced smelling salts, you haven't lived yet, people. I've had to use it before. 
on somebody else. And man, that wakes up the entire room. It is an assault on the senses. It's ammonia. The Duke was holding Jamie by the shoulders to keep him in the chair. He wasn't totally passed out, but not clear either. He heard her moving around. There was rustling, then a pop. Ammonia fumes went up his nose. It's awful. He choked, sputtered, breathed, eyes watering hard. And as he sat up, he could see Minnie holding the vial of salts. He could barely see her through his tearing eyes. And here's what she says. Poor man, you must be half dead with travel and hungry to boot. It's past tea time and I'll wage you've had not a bite in hours. Really, Hal? So she totally admonishes Hal for not feeding Jamie straight away. He was indignant that he had sent for food and was about to again. It's because she told Pilcock to go to the attics that there was no food. Poor Hal. So Minnie orders Hal to go tell Cook. And she turned toward Jamie and says, I'll give Mr... Fraser, James Fraser. He hadn't used his real name in years. It felt odd. How tragic a man with no name he had become. This feeds back into when Claire found him in Voyager and all the names that he had used and he was using at the time. So as we go through, like I said, think about how some of these pieces fit elsewhere because this is information that we may get a glimpse of but you don't get a full picture of in the Outlander series by itself. She says she'll give Jamie brandy and what to tell Cook they need immediately. The Duke said something vulgar in French, but went. <laughs> Only Minnie could make him do something like that. Okay, so that's the first time Hal cusses in another language. Jamie took the cup from her and looked at her over the brim. Her lips pressed. For the sake of the cause we once shared, I pray you say nothing, not yet. Ooh, they've known each other a long time. Jamie was embarrassed and unsettled from fainting. So, where do you suppose he knows her from? Jamie was embarrassed and unsettled from fainting, and in front of the enemy, no less. Now here he sat, drinking tea from a porcelain cup with a gold rim, sharing sandwiches and cakes from a similarly adorned platter with that very enemy. He was confused, annoyed, and at a considerable disadvantage. He didn't like it. But, of course, the food was good, so there was that. And since he didn't know what to make of things... It's all okay. And he was hungry. He had had no breakfast because his belly clenched the moment he saw London near. Poor guy. His tummy gets upset when he gets stressed out. Thankfully, Pardlo spoke nothing of the fainting episode. He simply offered more food or asked for, like, the mustard to be passed. They ate in quite a businesslike fashion. The woman, as Jamie puts it, left and hadn't returned. He had known her as Mina Rennie. She was a 17-year-old daughter of a bookseller in Paris who dealt in information. She had carried messages between her father and Jamie during his days there before the Rising. Paris seemed as distant as the planet Jupiter, he thought. The distance between a young spy and a duchess seemed even greater. Now, in case you don't know... There's a novella going to be coming out about Hal and Minnie and how they met and all those things. It's going to be really fun, I think. He thinks on her words. Had she been a Jacobite, really? Her father was all about the money, he thought. But he ate cake, thinking he hadn't tasted chocolate since Paris. So his mind is careening everywhere. He's all over the place, and he doesn't know how to put everything into the puzzle yet, so he's just chaotic. He thinks she could have been a Jacobite, 
because that doomed cause attracted romantic people. And then Quinn came to his mind, and his body reacted, raising the hairs on his forearms. He'd almost forgotten about him. What would Quinn think hearing about Jamie being dragged off by English soldiers? And again, he decided nothing could be done about anything right now, so he put his cup down, stating wordlessly he was ready to talk. Now, the way he's doing things, where he's just saying, oh, but it's okay for now, reminds me also of something Claire might do. His behavior seems a little different than what we've seen him do before. Or because it's solidly in his voice, we're really getting the straight dope on what he does versus through Claire's voice. I don't know. What do you think about that? But I see a lot of that. I mean, had she really impacted him that much? A few years of being together. The Duke does the same and asks Jamie if he considers himself in debt to him. No, I did not ask you to save my life. The Duke acknowledges Jamie had asked him to shoot him, really. And Jamie doesn't currently hold it against him? To make sure of this, the Duke asks in another way. Well then, he held up both hands and folded down one thumb. You spared my brother's life. The other thumb folded. I spared yours. An index finger. You objected to this action. The other index finger. But have upon consideration withdrawn your objection. He raised both eyebrows and Jamie quelled a reluctant impulse to smile. He inclined his head half an inch instead and Pardlow nodded, lowering his hands. So he wants to make sure that there is no debt between them and that they're clear and on the same page. But then he asks if there's no lingering sense of injury. And Jamie dryly responds, he wouldn't go that far. But there's nay debt between the two of us. Jamie says he wouldn't go that far, but there's no debt between the two of them. And Pardlow caught the meaning that he meant between Pardlow and Jamie, not us as in John, too. Whatever issues John and Jamie have between them doesn't concern Pardlow at all, as long as it doesn't interfere with what he's going to put in front of Jamie. This made Jamie wonder what John had told Pardlow about their disagreements. But if he didn't care, neither did Jamie. Speak then comes out of Jamie's mouth. And this made him uneasy as these were the words he had spoken to John that preceded that final terrible conversation. He didn't think this conversation would end any better. And Pardlow tells Jamie to follow him. They go to a small, cramped, dark study. It's a well-used personal room. No servant dared to be in there. Jamie found it oddly appealing. Pardlow gestured for Jamie to sit, then unlocked a drawer. Why would he need something locked up? The Duke took out the bundle of tied papers and put in front of Jamie the one neither he or John could decipher, the one Minnie had said was Earth. Jamie picks it up and tilts it toward the light. The Duke wants to know, can he read it? More or less I. You want to know what it says? Is that it? Yes, he wants to know if it's the speech of the Scottish Highlands. He says, no, it's Irish. Some say it's Irish too, but he has contempt in his voice when he says that. Irish, the Duke exclaims and stands up. He says it's close enough to his own tongue he can follow it. That it's a poem of sorts. The Duke is momentarily surprised. He asks what poem and what does it say. Jamie thinks on it, rubbing his forefinger down his nose. He says it's not named or a proper poem or one that he knows of, but it's a tale of the wild hunt. Can that do ya? The Duke thought... And he'd heard of it in Germany, but not Ireland. Jamie shrugged, putting the page down. He was fighting a cough off from something in the study. 
Jamie had spent nearly four years virtually outside. He slept in the barn. I can't imagine being in a house for any length of time would trigger coughs, sneezes, and other assortments of things, maybe headaches. Then Jamie says, Do you not find ghost stories everywhere, or fairy tales? Ghosts? Pardlow glanced at the page, frowning, then picked it up, scowling as though he'd force it to talk to him. Jamie was getting the creeps. I mean, Minnie was mentioned sending John to Ireland, and now this poem and Quinn shenanigans going on in Ireland. He's getting a bad feeling. Suddenly, Pardlow crumples the paper, throws it at the wall, and cusses in Greek. Foreign cuss number two. And what has that to do with Cyverly? He demands, glaring at Jamie. I'm pretty sure this is a rhetorical question. This startles Jamie, and he asks, Cyverly? Who? Gerald Cyverly? Then instantly he thinks, oops, as he sees the Duke react. Oh, this thrills Pardlow. He says, you do know him, quietly. I can away that you're talking to a fellow hunter. Jamie lifts one shoulder. Why would he lie? He knew a man by that name once. What of it? What indeed? He asks if Jamie will share the circumstances in which he knew a Gerald Cyverly. It's all so formal the way they're speaking. It almost sounds like peering around corners to see if the coast is clear. Not wanting to give anything away. Not wanting to appear too eager or too pushy. Strategic way of speaking. Jamie ponders it over. Then he thinks he owes nothing to Cyverly that he can think of. He still has no idea why he's there, so why be obstructive? And he had been fed, so there was that. <laughs> so he's singing for his meal. And Jamie's playing a long and short game here. Until he knows what's what, he has to be really ginger and just go along with it. The Duke picked up on Jamie's thought, and he pulls out two cups and a brown bottle. And he says, it's not a bribe, but he doesn't like drinking alone, and he needs to drink to keep his temper about Cyverly at bay. The effects from the wine after so long without caused Jamie pause to drinking whiskey, but smelling it as it was uncorked had him nodding. Jamie picks up the cup and says, Cyverly? With a question mark. He's thinking. Well, of course, he knew Cyverly because of Mina Rennie, but he pushed that thought right out of the way, and he inhaled the sweet, fierce fumes of the drink. No whiskey for years. That must have been a pleasure. And he says, the man I can't was... And he says, the man I can't was no real Irishman. Though he'd some land in Ireland, and I think his mother was maybe Irish. He was a friend of O'Sullivan, him who was later quartermaster for Charles Stewart. Pardlow caught the hesitation because Jamie owned Prince Charles. And... He was trying to figure out the meaning. So Cyrilly had Jacobite connections, but maybe not a Jacobite himself. And Jamie shook his head and took a cautious sip. It was glorious. And he thought maybe it was worth being dragged off like a convict. Then again. He explains how Cyrilly dabbled in Jacobite affairs with who and where he'd seen him. As he thought of one of the men, he got a pang in his belly. He was executed on Tower Hill, just like his grandfather. He made a silent salute and drank. He said then Cyverly was gone. He saw no profit in it. He wasn't with Charles Stewart at Glenfinnan nor after. He sipped. These memories of the rising had become too vivid. He could even feel Claire by his elbow. He was afraid to look. Could it be his memories from that time were so vivid because he clung so tightly to Claire? He couldn't have one without the other? Were they that interwoven? Was she that powerful a force to keep all the other memories alive as well? The Duke asked Jamie to read the papers. 
Jamie was reluctant, but he could find no reason not to read them, so he did. The Duke wasn't a sitter, he was a fidgeter, and he coughed. Jamie had to focus due to the distraction. How much reading do you think Jamie had done in the past years? Was his eyesight the same? As Jamie read, he thought Cy really made the most of his army career in Canada. Jamie disapproved of his behavior and general principles and also appreciated the passion the pages were written with, but it left no personal ill feelings. But when he got to the part about pillaging and terrorizing of the habitant villages, his blood began to rise. This was more than personal villainy on the part of Cyberly. This was the crown at work. This was the way to deal with resistant natives, theft, rape, murder, and fire. This cleansing Cumberland had done in the Highlands, and James Wolfe had done it to deprive the Citadel at Quebec of support. And suddenly he thinks of Claire and his unknown child, God that she might be safe and the child with her. He can only survive what he shouldn't have, believing them to be safe. He looked up, and the Duke was filling a pipe with tobacco. He was still coughing. And he thinks he and his troops could have stayed behind and taken part in the cleansing after Culloden. That's not a good thought. That question the Duke had asked came back to the surface. No lingering sense of injury? Jamie muttered a very rude remark in Gaelic under his breath. He went back to reading, but his mind was still distracted. This is where his distracted mind took him. Blood pressure. That's what Claire called it. To do with how hard your heart beat and the force with which it drove the blood round your body. When your heart failed you and blood no longer reached the brain, that's what caused fainting, she said. And when it beat hard in the grip of fear or passion, that was when you felt the blood beat in your temples and swell in your chest, ready for bed or battle. His own blood pressure was rising like a rocket, and he'd no desire to bed Pardlo. <laughs> He's always so funny. He's not had to think along the lines of military, politics, intrigue, or much of the sorts for years. He's having to face memories. He's exercising rusty brain muscles. It's a lot to take in. The next paragraph says the Duke took a spill, put it into the candle flame, and lit his pipe with it. What is a spill, you ask? A thin strip of wood or paper used for lighting a fire, candle pipe, etc. Its origin is Middle English. This is a very unusual use of this word, and it's meant... Like to spill water, to fall off a horse, to spill someone's blood since the 19th century. So it went out of favor pretty quickly after this point. Clever of her. Jamie describes the time. It had grown dark. It was about to rain. So he describes the weather. And he describes how the Duke looked smoking his pipe in this type of lighting. It looked like a skull. Is that symbolism for something? The skull? Again, this also reminds me of something Claire would do. And I've gone through this book a few times before, and I don't think I ever noticed that. But as I'm looking at his behavior, I'm seeing so much of her, as well as the amount that she has brought up within him. It intrigues me. It makes me have more questions. And Jamie abruptly asks the Duke what he wants of him. He wants him to translate the page of Irish and tell him anything else he can about Cyverly. And you think I'd do it for the asking? Yes, I do. Why not? And the Duke raises a middle finger of one hand. I would consider it a debt to be paid. <laughs> Put that bloody finger down before I ram it up your backside, Jamie says. The Duke's mouth twitched, but he put the finger down with no comment. Now, they're working each other a little bit, getting a little more comfortable, seeing what the other will do. He also wanted to see Jamie 
to decide if he could help bring Cyberly to justice. He thinks he can help, and justice is what he's most concerned about. Jamie is determined to be mindful, and he pauses before he asks, What assistance does the Duke need? As the Duke exhales, Jamie realizes it's hemp smoke, not tobacco. He smelled it before. He remembered a doctor in Paris prescribing it for a lung complaint. The Duke didn't look ill or sound like he was. That last little piece of information, tuck away deeply for a later Outlander book. Remember it. Diana weaves these things in and out. You know she does. Pardlow explains Cyberly has taken leave and disappeared. They think he's gone to his estate in Ireland. He wants him found and brought back. Now here's the clencher. My brother is going to Ireland on this mission, but he will require help. He and Jamie interrupts angrily. Did he bloody tell you to fetch me here? Does he think that I, with his fists tight... Pardlow assures him he has no idea what John thinks, and that John has no idea Jamie has been brought there. Then he added, whatever disagreements you and he may have do not concern me. Then he looks at Jamie straight on. I dislike doing this, and I regret the necessity. And OMG, Jamie's response? Jamie stares straight back. I've been fucked up the arse by an Englishman before. Spare me the kiss I... How surprised were you that Jamie would say such a thing? And we know he meant it literally. But how would the Duke take it? I'm sure he meant, in a proverbial sense, you know, the highlands being cleansed and everything burned down and all the men going to prison and then sent to America. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But wow. Knowing that was there still blows my mind when I read it. Pardlow only breathes. And he puts his hands flat on the desk. And here are his orders. You will accompany Lieutenant Colonel Gray to Ireland and there render him every assistance in locating Major Cyverly and compelling his return to England, as well as obtaining evidence to aid in his prosecution. Or your parole will be revoked. You will be taken to the Tower today and there committed to imprisonment at His Majesty's pleasure. The Duke paused. Do you require a moment to consider the situation? He asked politely. Man, that is hardball. And that's dirty hardball. Jamie stands up and asks, When? It'll be in a few days. The Duke then looks him over head to toe, the first time not looking at his face, tells him he needs clothing. He'll travel as the gentleman he is, under parole, of course. And I will consider myself in your debt, Mr. Fraser. And the Greys always pay their debts, don't they? Jamie looked at him with contempt and turned on his heel. Where are you going? Pardlow asks in surprise. Out. Under parole, of course. I love that response. And then Pardlow's response is amazing. Supper's at eight. Don't be late, will you? It puts Cook out. The subtle jockeying, the testosterone. And I also like how Hal, overall, treats him fairly, equally in a sense, even though he's lording over that damned parole. I mean, Jamie is a convicted traitor. And boy, is this likely to piss John off royally. Ha! Well, look at that. This two chapters ended up taking up way more time than the last week's. We're going to do two chapters a week, unless one is very short. Because it's okay if we go into June. Since the premiere is not till September, we have all the time we need. And then we can really dig into this and enjoy it. Where can you find A Dram of Outlander? Well, on Facebook, it's A Dram of Outlander page. You can also search for the podcast listener only group, a Dram of Outlander. You just have to ask to join. Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. Of course, the website is adramofoutlander.com. You sense a theme. 
Yes, you do. And how do you participate? Well, post on the social media pages, interact with others, interact with me. Come and join us on the Wednesday night Twitter chat at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's really easy. You just type in the hashtag, hashtag ADOO for A Drama of Outlander. Click on it and you can see the whole chat going on and include that in your own tweets for everyone to see. That's every week, unless I'm catching a baby or like this past Wednesday, I was prone and I could not participate. So it's all the time. You can send me an email to a dram of outlander at gmail.com. Leave a phone message with your comments, questions, anything you want at 719-425-9444. And it could be included in a future episode. Share the podcast. That's how you can support me. That's how you can support the podcast. Share it with other people. Go to iTunes and leave a review. Tell people about it. Come on and like all the pages. And if you'd like, you can make a financial contribution one time or go to patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander and make a monthly contribution of a couple dollars or more. So next week, we're going to be covering the next two chapters, 9 and 10. And I'm so glad I got to get this done this week. My voice held out. It was a little precarious, but we made it. And I'm just excited to be doing this. This is a, a different flavor. And I think it's only going to get better from here on out. Man, I can't wait till John finds out Jamie's there. All right. I hope you have a fantastic week. And until next time, Slangeva.